Today, we're taking a look at a French aircraft. One that was not particularly glamorous or particularly well known, but it was one of the few relatively modern ish French fighters that saw combat in the interwar period. Though it ultimately wasn't used during the Second World War, the Dewatine D371 was used during the Spanish Civil War, which for many designers served as the technological prelude for the challenges of the Second World War a few years later. And, as far as the 371 went, it would trial some of the interesting technologies and ideas that would end up being used in the more famous Dewatine aircraft designs that came after it. Its origins begin at the start of 1930. At this time, the French aviation industry was, on the whole, thriving, with numerous aeronautical companies producing interesting, although sometimes very bizarre looking designs. But it was around this time that officials of the French Air Force, the Army de l'Air, began to notice a trend. Fighters such as the Newport Delage NID-62 were certainly excellent in terms of manoeuvrability and handling, but they were beginning to lag behind their contemporaries in terms of speed. Some of these other aircraft, such as the Bristol Bulldog, despite being older, of a biplane configuration, and having a lower power engine, were actually still proving to be faster when it came to straight line speed. Because of this, in early 1930, the Air Force sought out new designs from France's aircraft industry. Specifically, they were looking for a new monoplane fighter that could achieve a sea level top speed of no less than 300 km an hour. One of the companies to draw up designs to this new requirement would be Dewatine. At first, Emile Dewatine, the head of the company, considered an approach that favoured cost savings. And this was because the economy in 1930 was not exactly in a healthy state. This plan would have simply involved mounting a more powerful engine onto an existing airframe, but he quickly ruled this out, as the resulting design, though highly economical, would have less future potential built into it, and it would have become outclassed far too quickly. Instead, he decided to begin work on an all-new design from scratch. Said design work would be completed exceedingly quickly, and before the end of the year, the company had not only designed the aircraft, but a prototype had also been built, dubbed the D-37. Now, owing to other design commitments within the company at the time, of which one was about to have a very direct impact on the prototype's success, the D-37 was not actually built in Dawatine's Toulouse factory, but was instead built by Lioré et Olivier. As completed, it was equipped with a 740 horsepower Gnome Rhone Mistral Major, a 14 cylinder radial engine. It featured a single parasol wing supported by struts above the fuselage, and it came with a relatively roomy open cockpit, courtesy of the engine width dictating the shape of the fuselage. Taking to the skies in October of 1930, the prototype demonstrated fairly good performance and speed, but although it was developed very quickly, in a matter of months, the Air Force was already being drawn to an even newer and more advanced design drawn up by Dewatine not long after this one, the D-500. Though it was comparatively early in its development, the Air Force showed significantly more interest in the D-500's low wing, its sleek lines, and the ability to mount a 20mm cannon firing through the propeller shaft, which was something that the D-37 with its radial engine could not do. At this point in time, the D-500 was also planned to be equipped with a retractable undercarriage, which would have made the D-37 look archaic in comparison. Although, of course, this decision was ultimately not taken. Although the Army's attention had been somewhat drawn away at this point, the Aeronaval, the French naval air arm, were interested in the design, and they organised further design meetings with Dawatine. Meanwhile, Dewatine was happy with the attention the D-500 was getting from the Air Force, but he was still convinced that the D-37 had a place alongside it, and so he went back to the drawing board and continued further development work on the design. It would be a fairly protracted development, but work would continue over the course of the next two years, with construction eventually beginning on the long-awaited second prototype that was dubbed the D-371. 
This aircraft would be equipped with an uprated engine of 930 horsepower, and would, in terms of construction at least, be fairly modern by the time it was completed. It featured an all-metal fuselage that utilised monocoque construction, a modified and strengthened wing, and it had an aerodynamically improved engine cowling and landing gear, the latter of which now also featured wheel brakes. The maiden flight took place in February of 1924, and it was considered on the whole a success, with the aircraft demonstrating a maximum speed of 400 kilometers an hour at 4,500 meters. In terms of armament, it would feature either two or four 7.5 mm MAC machine guns mounted in underwing gun pods. The performance increase of the second prototype was good enough to earn a production contract, and it would serve as the first of a production run of 29 examples, all of which were delivered to the French Air Force by December of 1935. While this was going on, work quickly began on yet another variant, a follow-up dubbed the D-372, which would be broadly similar to the 371, except that the wheel brakes would be removed, the reasons for which I could not fully verify, but it appears that their use as brakes was considered suggestive rather than actually effective, and two of the machine guns were relocated to the engine cowling to fire through the propeller arc. An alternative armament variant of two 20mm Orlikon cannons mounted in the wing was also tested, but this was considered a less than ideal layout, mainly because the cannons were limited to just 30 rounds of ammunition per gun, which equated to about 3.4 seconds of firing time. Not exactly ideal. Though this new design was once again an improvement, interest was beginning to wane. Lithuania expressed some interest in the aircraft and placed an initial order for 14 export models, but the sale would eventually fall through. After a delegation of Lithuanian officials arrived at the Dawatin testing facility for some evaluations, they were sorely disappointed to find that operating the aircraft at high speed caused significant wear and tear on the engine, necessitating the purchase of extra spare parts, something which their budget did not cover. Instead, they opted to use their investment on the purchase of seven D500s. Because of this, Dewatin was now left with 14 D-372s on their hands, and after trying and failing to pawn them off on the utterly uninterested French Air Force, who were also caressing the D-500, it was decided to turn their gaze elsewhere. At the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War, the Republicans, who were trying to put an air force together, were on the market for some fairly modern but affordable aircraft to equip their fledgling air units, and the D-372 appeared to be a good fit. On August the 6th, 1936, a delegation for Republican Spain put through an official order. Once in Spain, manned by French, Spanish, and Italian volunteers, they formed into a new squadron that was simply called Espana. There was, however, one little tiny baby caveat. These aircraft, which were designed as fighters, were delivered completely unarmed because the French government decided that it wanted to take a very staunchly neutral approach to their support. This somewhat limited the aircraft's effectiveness during the war, understandably, and their use in this conflict is not particularly well documented, though it appears that some were used for a mix of reconnaissance and liaison duties. At approximately the same time as this, back in France, the D-373, a navalized version of the aircraft, had been put into service with the Aero Naval. Nineteen of them were ordered and delivered to the aircraft carrier Bayan, and after a brief working up period, they officially entered service. The Navy, shortly after taking delivery of this first batch, ordered another 25 of the D-376s, which was basically the same aircraft but with folding wings. Despite having over 40 of the Dawatin aircraft in service, they were not a particular favourite amongst the pilots who flew them, mainly because the engine was plagued by mechanical problems, and having an engine failure whilst taking off or landing from an aircraft carrier is not exactly ideal. One interesting point to note about these navalized D-37 series, though, is that they were modified with 13.2mm Hotchkiss machine guns. 
which meant that, technically speaking, and not counting the experiments with the cannons, these would be the most heavily armed versions of the design. Despite the engine problems, they were in fact still in service by September of 1939 at the outbreak of war between France and Germany, despite being severely outdated by that point. Though they would never actually see active duty or combat in the war, as they were very quickly replaced by Vought V-156s. Now, back over in Spain, the aircraft would technically be more successful, as this is where the type actually made its combat debut. Fierce negotiations between Republican officials and the French had led to the delivery of an additional three aircraft that actually retained their armament, and these were sent over to the Espana squadron. They were mostly used as bomber escorts, and during one mission, they downed several Heinkel AG-51 biplanes that had been sent to intercept them. This wasn't a huge achievement, as the HE-51 was considerably more outdated, but in another engagement, which essentially amounted to a straight-up one-on-one fight, these three aircraft went up against three Fiat CR-32s and shot down all three of them without sustaining a single loss or major damage. Unfortunately, three things curtailed the 371's success in this theatre. Its engine, its lack of numbers, and the increasing power of the enemy. Spare parts began to run low, and some of the unarmed aircraft were pulled from service and cannibalised to keep the armed models running. Then, the arrival of newer Soviet I-16s rendered it more or less obsolete, and after this, it didn't even serve for long in a backup role, as almost all of these aircraft were then destroyed in a single bombing raid by the German Condor Legion. Though generally considered more of a failure than a success, the Dewatine parasol fighters provided the company with some valuable lessons. These were quickly applied to upgraded versions of the D500 and subsequent designs that were being drawn up. Perhaps the biggest impact of this aircraft, though, was the fact that it thoroughly turned Dewatine away from using radial engines, and he now put all of his company's faith in the Hispano Suiza V12, an engine which would eventually go on to power the company's most successful design, the D520. But that is a story for another day. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and a big thank you, of course, to the Patreon supporters. Apologies again for the delay in these videos, I had thought things were somewhat sorted out in the new house, but then a heap of furniture arrived moderately ahead of schedule, and I'm now able to quickly finish building all of them and getting the recording studio fully set up. So hopefully you'll see some of that in the near future with a new video format that I am planning, but more on that later on. A big thank you of course to our Wing Command tier patrons, our highest tier supporters, and a warm welcome to T. Patrick, who is the newest member of this special group. I'm not exactly sure what date this video is exactly going up, because it all depends on when editing gets finished in between house stuff, but hopefully midweek. And hopefully there'll be another video coming up this weekend as well, the schedule is a bit all topsy-turvy. But as always, thank you all so much for your continued support and patience, and I will catch you all next time. Goodbye.